Hi, I'm Caleb Hoffman, and I'm a senior at Christopher Newport, majoring in cellular, molecular, and physiological biology. And today I'm going to be talking about aquaculture, but more specifically, bluefin tuna farming, and how it has potential threats against the environment and consumer health. So I chose to do research on this topic because I catch bluefin tuna annually and would, am curious about the environmental and consumer impacts that bluefin tuna farming has caused. So my next slide is an outline going over what is in this presentation. But first I'm going to talk about aquaculture in general and then I'm going to dial in more specifically on bluefin tuna farming and why it's a growing industry and then compare America to a foreign country like Japan and then talk about how it affects commercial fishermen and the socioeconomic benefits of bluefin tuna farming and its impact on consumer health. I'll also talk about why it is controversial and what the future holds and what needs to be done to ensure that it is sustainable and will be beneficial to the consumers. So aquaculture is a growing method to address the high demand for seafood. There are two different types, culture-based and capture-based. Culture-based is where they are spawned artificially and grown to a certain size to be harvested and then capture-based is when they're taken out of the environment and put into a cage to grow to a certain size to be harvested and brought to the market. So both of them are fed nutrient enriched things to make them grow at a faster rate to reach a certain size. And the, on to the next side, bluefin tuna farming is kind of a hybrid of aquaculture. It is capture based, it is a capture based method where they go out and catch these tunas out of the wild and put them in cages and raise them to a certain size and they are commonly fed herring, squid, and sardines. But as you can see in this picture, there is a lot wasted because the birds will dive down and grab the food before the tuna can get to it. So a lot of these tuna ranches have converted to soy pellets, which is a more eco-friendly way of feeding these tunas. But there are chemicals involved in making the soy pellets, which does impact consumer health. And another way of bluefin tuna harvesting is traditional fishery based, which has been going on for centuries, which does seem like a least invasive way of harvesting seafood, but it doesn't meet the demands today. And a fun fact is that each tuna is fed about 6% of their biomass a day. So that gives you an idea of how much food is needed to supply these tuna farms. So on to the next slide. This table gives you an idea of how big these bluefin can get based on their age. And I found that the largest recorded was about 1,500 pounds and 118 inches. So I thought that was really amazing. And I think that this just gives a good idea of how the age correlates with the size of the fish. So on to the next slide. This talks about the increased demand. On the right here is a picture of a tuna auction in Japan and commercial fishermen struggle to meet these seafood demands and struggle to supply enough tuna to go to these auctions and part of the reason is because they experience a total allowable catch which puts a cap on how many they can harvest and bring to the market which allows the bluefin tuna farms to bring more to the market and have the benef and have the benefits economically and dominate the industry in that way so on to the next slide I'll talk about America in Japan and compare the two. So if you know anything about bluefin tuna farming, one of the first things you'll probably think about is Japan because they have the most resources. America on the other hand struggles to have enough resources to do this bluefin tuna farming because the coastal communities often reject aquaculture. However, in San Diego, California, there is a tuna ranch where they raise the Pacific bluefin tuna and there's a picture of this ranch on the left, on the right um, that is off of San Diego, California. So the, on the next slide there is a pie graph that shows the bluefin tuna harvested globally and as you can see the majority is from the Mediterranean and Black Sea. That is because there are less regulations in this in, in overseas in the Mediterranean and Black Sea areas. And in America, there's, it is the most highly regulated fishery. So there is not a very fair balance in this industry because America is so regulated, but overseas, 
the cat, there's no catch reports and the catches are not monitored as much as they should be. So it's really difficult to understand the status of the species accurately because so many of tuna, tuna are being taken out of the wild population overseas without anybody even knowing. And they're brought to the market. So the small private sectors do cause harm overseas because they're not monitored and they bring fish to, market, to the market and often they farm these fish improperly causing diseases and parasites to spread from the caged tuna to the wild population in proximity to their fish farms. So on to the next slide, this talks about the socioeconomic benefit. The picture on the right is a sushi chef who had bought this tuna for about $630,000, which gives you a good idea of how much these tuna are really worth. So the benefit of the bluefin farming is that they can time the market to create the best product possible, and they do this by fattening the fish. And as the fish is fattened to a certain size, then they are, they are then harvested and brought to the market. This gives an advantage over the commercial fishermen because the commercial fishermen have a non-selective method of bluefin harvesting because whatever they catch is what is brought to the market. They have no control over what the quality of meat is or how big they are. So this picture gives a great idea of what they're really worth. And it's really an outrageous amount of money for a fish, but anyways, on to the next slide. <clears throat> This slide talks about consumer health and how there are pathogens that arise in these fish cages that can spread to the wild population. One of them being a blood fluke or a flatworm and they reside in the lumen of the heart of the bluefin and there's a picture of one on the right here and when they arise in the cages of the bluefin they do often spread to the wild populations and they can cause genetic mutations and abnormalities down the road. So, and they're also brought to the market and people don't even know. So that increases the risk of foodborne illness and there are artificial feeds that are brought to these farmed fish. And there's also cage pollutants because the tunas swim around in their own waste in a very condensed cage, which is pretty unsanitary. And so on to the next slide. There's other limitations. Diseases and genetic mutations were already mentioned in the last slide. <clears throat> but the small pelagic fish populations also face uh, increased pressure as the bluefin tuna demand increases. Because as the bluefin demand increases, more pelagic fish are being taken out of the wild and put into these fish farms. So on this picture to the right here, you can see how the farm tuna have put more pressure on the pelagic fish and the mackerel than the wild tuna, meaning that these fish species are going to be depleted down the road if, it keeps in, if the demand keeps increasing at this rate. <clears throat> also, another limitation is that benthic communities in proximity of these fish farms experience biodiversity. There are microparticles created in these caged, in these pens that, that put a film on the seafloor that is in proximity of the fish farms and the microbiota that lived on the seafloor near these caged tuna prior to them being there can no longer survive there or have to relocate. So it definitely does change the biodiversity of the marine environment around the tuna farms. And then of course since America's highly regulated fishery challenge commercial fishermen, commercial fishermen are no longer going to be motivated to provide fresh caught seafood to uh, the consumers. So lastly, moving forward, it is extremely necessary to create allocated zones for aquaculture, which means there's designated zones that are strictly for fish farming that protect it from recreational activities and pollutants. And then it's important to integrate management practices into these fish farming organizations because a lot of these small private sector bluefin farms overseas lack the professionalism needed to do this properly and lack the professionalism needed to prevent diseases and mutations and parasites from spreading from the, ca from the caged tuna to the wild population. It is also important to have tuna pens further from coastlines 
which will be a part of the allocated zones, and then commercial fishermen, of course, need more incentives because they're not being paid enough for their price per pound. So the picture to the right here is a perfect example of an allocated zone. It is a cage site in Boston Bay in the Spencer Gulf of South, South Australia, and it is further off the coastline where it doesn't harm the environment near the coast, and there are, is a limited amount of pollutants, and diseases do not spread as frequently. So that, that wraps up my presentation, and thank you for listening. And the last slide is my citations. Hope you have a good day.